Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark, and I am a survivor of the celebrity world. Uh, for 10 years, I edited Heat magazine, putting up with the whims and egos of these spoiled, pampered people. And frankly, it sends you a little bit mad. By the end of the 10 years, I'd stolen interviews from other magazines, congratulated Victoria Beckham in print for the fact that she was pregnant with a baby girl, when of course it wasn't, it was a baby boy, and even got one of my team to uh, manage to talk their way into, to infiltrate, very topical, this Cheryl and Ashley's wedding. Uh, after an hour of sweet talking and cajoling, we found out they'd infiltrated completely the wrong wedding. As I say, the celebrity world, it turns you, turns you a bit mad. However, over the course of that 10 years, we'd also done something quite big and important in the world of magazines. We turned a 50,000 a week selling magazine into one that sold half a million a week. So, this is the story of a celebrity magazine, but it is more than that. It's a story of how understanding your market and your customers is of prime importance and how being different and have the strength of your beliefs mean you can actually shape an entire market. So, um, the date is February the 1st, 1999. A new magazine uh, makes its way onto the newsstands of Britain. Uh, we put about 300,000 copies onto the newsstands of Britain. Most of them stay there, it's fair to say, for the entire week. Uh, in fact, there's many in the industry who think they're nailed to those shelves. Um, Heat magazine was meant to be a very wordy, very serious look at the world of entertainment, at the world of music, television and film. Not many pictures in it, lots of words. Uh, it was very serious, it took the whole thing very seriously. Um, and no one bought it. We were the most famous magazine flop of a generation. We were putting out 300,000 copies, we were selling about 50,000 every single week. People were writing about us, they were saying we were going to close. It was a bit of a disaster, to be frank. Um, we were doing this, we were kind of wondering why people weren't interested in what we're doing, whereas over there, there was a magazine called OK Magazine, who were embracing this uh, newly rejuvenated thing called Celebrity. They put Victoria and David on the cover for their wedding, and they were embracing everything about the celebrity world, whereas we were just concentrating on the world of entertainment and it being a bit dull about it. And we knew we, knew we needed to change at this point. We just, the sales were not coming through. If you do a weekly magazine and you're not selling many copies, you lose an awful lot of money, and we were losing an awful lot of money. Understanding your customers and changing for them, if you want to succeed, is a hugely important thing. And we knew we had to do that. We were in the entertainment world, over there was a the celebrity world, and they were doing very, very well. Something needed to change. Um, about nine months into the magazine, so we're now in early 2000, we decided to revolutionise the magazine completely. The entertainment thing wasn't working. The celebrity culture, as we now know it, was growing by the day. So we embarked on Plan B. And Plan B, as so many Plan Bs at the time, involved Victoria Beckham. After a few months of cajoling, we managed to get her to do an interview. And we were selling around about 50, 60,000 at this point. With this issue, we leapt to 170,000. A lot of people talk about the success of heat and the success of a lot of businesses that change what they do as being in the right place at the right time. That is simply not true. There are some very lucky people who do end up in the right place at the right time. But what we did, and what many customers are doing now, what many companies are doing now, is they're changing the way, way they work so they are in the right place at the right time. But that takes a lot of effort. You very rarely just land there. We wanted to go where the action was. We wanted to go where the excitement was. Um, so we'd had a big sale of 170,000. We immediately fell back to 60,000. And we needed another big interview, and we needed it fast. We were approached by a journalist who'd done an interview with Robbie Williams for an international magazine. Who, uh, and the interview was really good. It was really explosive. And we wanted it on our cover. Only slight problem is she'd signed a piece of paper that said she could only 
sell it to the magazines she'd been commissioned by and it wasn't to be given to anyone else. We knew this, but we were desperate. These were desperate times. We'd had a kind of sense, a feel of the good life with some higher sales and then we'd fallen down immediately. We needed to do something about it. So we brought up the interview and then uh, at the end of the interview, which was so good we decided to divide into two, at the end of the interview we said, um, next week part two, you can't get enough of this interview, we've delivered you part one, we're going to deliver you in seven days time part two. And people were really excited. This was a great thing, this was a Robbie Williams interview an explosive Robbie Williams interview and we were promising them part two where he was going to talk about his feelings for Kylie Minogue. No one had done this, no one had run this story, a total exclusive. We thought we were top dogs until the day after we came on sale and we received a legal letter from Robbie's lawyers who said, uh, as you well know, the journalist who wrote this piece signed a piece of paper saying they weren't allowed to send, sell it to you or anyone else. Uh, we're going to see you for loads of money and and then this is the, this is the killer. Uh, you can't run part two. Part two of the interview, you cannot run. And um, we had the real problem because we'd promised this to people. And because we now had a few more customers, because we now had a few more people who were into the magazine, into the new ethos of the magazine, we were just about to let them down in a really brutal way just after months and months of effort going into re-engaging them, spending up money on a new ad campaign, and getting people to see the world the way that we wanted them to see it. And we were, you know, we kind of fell apart. This was an absolute disaster for us. So we had three days to somehow get a cover feature together. I dispatched various members of my team into the kind of uh, the back room at Heat magazine to find uh, the back issues that we'd done, the back issues that other magazine and newspapers had done. Somehow we managed to cobble together a piece where we found a quote from Robbie where he was talking about Kylie, found a quote from Kylie where she was talking about Robbie, and finally we hadn't let people down. These customers, these people who'd come to us, who liked what we were doing, uh, we weren't going to let them down. Finally we had something to show them. And I think the lesson I learned from this is in any company that you're trying to turn around, you need to be brave and you need to make decisions and you need to be strong. This extra, this extra effort we went into, although to be frank, we didn't see it as extra effort, we saw it as utter, utter desperation at the time, can really separate you from the rest. We were doing something like this because we didn't want to let our readers down. We knew what our customers were like, we were getting, more to, we were getting to know them even more than before, and we knew that they, the worst thing that we could do was let them down. So we worked late nights that week, we did everything it took to make sure that we delivered them the product that we had promised and that they wanted. Um, we had a bit of good luck, I think it's fair to say, in July of 2000 when Big Brother Series 1 made its debut on the screens of Britain. But again, you know, you could say, was it good luck? This was, I remember actually seeing this cover on the screen of our art director um, just a couple of days before we were going to go take it to the printers. And um, I just looked at it and said, but he's not famous. This person, he's been locked in a house on TV. He's not a celebrity. He doesn't know any famous people. He doesn't do famous people things. He is an ordinary member of the public. In fact, a guy who worked in marketing. And um, it just seemed the oddest thing for us to do. But of course, the world of celebrity was changing. And Heat was onto that before the magazines and before newspapers. Every other newspaper, every other magazine would not touch Big Brother in Series 1 because it seemed like this weird psychological, sociological experiment. It didn't seem much like the world of celebrity. These people were a million miles away from Victoria Beckham. But what we did is we were brave. We said people are going to be watching this. They're the same age as the readers and we should be covering it. So again, we were getting to know more about our readers, getting to understand what they were like, knowing how old they were, what their interests were, what TV programs, and obsessively delivering a product that was for them.